so much and good morning again good good to be back with you and I uh, wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, to Bruce uh, for filling in uh, last week uh, with a wonderful word uh, from James uh, you know wisdom from above is applicable in any age uh, and uh, certainly in our time in our age I felt like while I was away, it was just another uh, strange uh, week in the world. Um, but we, uh, we definitely need uh, that godly wisdom. Uh, and uh, uh, really thank Bruce, too, for connecting that to our recent uh, studies in Romans as, as well. So thank you, sir. Appreciate that very much. And uh, it's good, uh, good to be uh, back here with you. It was uh, just a joy to just kind of get away with uh, it, it wasn't even part of the family. It was just everyone, uh, you know, the whole family, uh, just being together and enjoying time together. Uh, you can, um, uh, uh, Brenda's out with Rachel this morning, but uh, I think, uh, but pray for Brenda. She uh, got the, the worst uh, in terms of uh, both uh, sunburn and mosquito bites. Uh, I don't know how that happened because I think I feel like she worked the hardest to prevent that, and yet she's suffering the most from it, even even now. So I don't I don't know how that happened, but um, you know, keep, keep her in your prayers <laughs> as she uh, continues to heal from that. Uh, she uh, most definitely got the worst, uh, but uh, good good to see you all again. We are uh, still in Romans, and just one verse today. Uh, now, of course, you realize that that's no guarantee that the message will be any shorter. Uh, but, but uh, the words from Paul, and this is where I ended, uh, you know, uh, last time. Uh, I just kind of ended on this note of Romans chapter twelve, uh, verse one. So uh, let's uh, let's take a look at it. Romans twelve one, and I'll probably read verse two as well, since they do uh, go together. Uh, Therefore. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, uh, and perfect will. And they have a Lord had his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. More of a focus, I, I'm thinking, next week on, uh, on verse 2, but I really want to do look uh, at, this, uh, at this true uh, and uh, proper the spiritual act of worship that we uh, read of here in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you. Uh, so much for this morning, and we thank you for this place where we can come and gather as your children, where we can gather as believers, um, 
and just enjoy the time together and enjoy the blessings of being yours. And uh, just knowing that your arms are always around us, that your eyes are always upon us. Uh, nothing escapes your attention. Uh, the big things in our lives, the little things and everything in between, uh, you know it all. You know our hearts, you know what we bring with us this morning, you know the, what we're uh, celebrating within our hearts this morning, and you know what we're grieving also in our hearts this morning. You know what is bringing us joy uh, this very day, uh, you know what's bringing us perhaps some sorrow or even anxiety this day. You know it all, and uh, whatever it is, you are sovereign over all. And uh, we are grateful for it. Uh, we trust that you're here with us. We know it. Let it uh, help us to experience it, to really know that in our hearts and that your spirit will absolutely guide us through the study of your word this morning and that we have the opportunity to be nearer to you today than we were moments ago even. Uh, nearer than yesterday. Uh, it's, you know, we have this relationship with you that needs to grow and I pray that it will grow and that it will continue to flourish as we look at your word and as we offer you up praise and, and thanksgiving and as we consider all that you are all you've been and all you will be uh, we uh, give this morning to you may it glorify your beautiful name may your name be magnified uh, and may we rejoice those who proclaim that name and profess that name that's above all names. Um, be happy uh, with us this morning, I pray. <laughs> Look upon us and be pleased uh, with uh, all that we give uh, for your glory and for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so uh, we get to uh, look at this uh, wonderful uh, topic of worship this morning. Uh, by no means exhaustive, uh, but uh, certainly a, a, a beautiful uh, theme for us this morning. Uh, if you were to look up the, uh, the dictionary uh, definition of worship, uh, it's probably what you think already, you know. It's simply from the dictionary, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity, Right? Okay, so if we were to look at the, uh, the history, if we were to break down a little bit and look at the etymology of the word worship, we actually find that the word is directly related to the concept of worthiness. So, you know, uh, certainly we uh, uh, sing as a congregation, worthy is the lamb, right? Uh, to be praised, and so worship just equates worth. Something to keep in mind this morning as we're looking um, at uh, Paul's uh, words. There has to be, there must be worth uh, that's ascribed to the one that we're worshiping. And it just makes sense. Uh, so then, you know, what is it? You know, what is worship? And for some people, uh, in fact, for some people this very morning, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's just singing and and, and, and shouting and, and just raising your hands or it's prayer or it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, other forms of uh, demonstrative uh, 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 praise. And absolutely, uh, absolutely, yes, uh, you know, worship may incorporate all of those things. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, we're, we're rather quiet and subdued here, but, you know, that, that's not the only way to do it. Uh, you know, there's certainly... Uh, but worship is not synonymous uh, with those things. Uh, it's not synonymous with, uh, um, you know, with, with shouting and, and, and hands up high uh, in the air. It's not the same as singing and shouting and praying. Those things might absolutely indicate uh, that worship is happening, uh, but they're not essentially the essence of what worship is. Um, you can actually do all of those things without worshiping, right? And then conversely, uh, you can worship without doing any of those things, uh, you know, as we, uh, as we find ourselves often doing, you know. But one of the words for uh, worship in the New Testament, and there are a lot of words uh, in the New Testament for worship. 
There's a lot of words in the Old Testament for worship. But one of the words for worship in the New Testament uh, is the Greek verb proskeneo. Proskeneo. And uh, you'll see it several times in the New Testament. And it, it means to go down on one's knees to express reverence. Um, to go down and fall on one's knees to express uh, you know, respect, homage. Uh, so the word, uh, and, and, I, and I counted to me, I, you know, oftentimes uh, when I'm trying to give numbers, uh, you know, I'll find uh, several different, uh, I have to go and count for myself. <laughs> There's, you know, not that, but anyway, I, I, for my counting, uh, that word's used 25 times in the Gospels. Um, so, uh, in the Gospels, that word's mainly uh, used of, uh, to speak of people coming and, and bowing before uh, the Lord Jesus and worshiping him. Not, not, uh, not on every occasion. Uh, that word's also used, you know, uh, for people who are bowing down before men, bowing down before angels, or, you know. So, it's not used on every occasion uh, concerning our Lord Jesus. I do want to make note of that. Uh, but it is used several times uh, in that manner. And then, so like 25 times or so in the Gospels, but then it's used 22 times in the book of Revelation at the end of the, of the New Testament. Um, uh, so you'll find it several times uh, as you go through the book. However, and this is what caught me, and, and I, I'm bringing it to your attention this morning, it's used only once in all of the epistles. Uh, so it, when you think about Paul's epistles, this word proskeneo is used only once. And I thought that was very interesting. I don't know if you'll find it interesting, but as I was, I was found it so interesting. Why? You know, because when we're looking at the epistles, the, you know, these letters that Paul wrote, uh, you, know, it, you know, they were usually uh, written to direct the New Testament church in their conduct, right? And in their worship, we would assume, right? And so why is that word worship used only once? It's used once in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 25. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 25, concerning prophecy, that whenever people were prophesying in the New Testament church, the secrets of people's hearts would be revealed, and so falling down on their face, they would, uh, as the text says there, worship God, exclaiming that God is really among you. That's the only time the word proskeneo for worship is used in the epistles. Uh, now, it's not the only time we see the word worship in the epistles, right? Um, but in that sense, proskeneo, of just falling flat, it, uh, you know, it, it's used only that one time by the apostle. Uh, you will see, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, you will see the word worship uh, twice in Colossians. Um, different word for worship on both occasions in Colossians. Uh, you'll see the word worship in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, and again, it's a different word. Uh, the words that you see used for worship in Colossians and in 2 Thessalonians, uh, they are directly related to self-worship. Uh, the words ascribe to worshiping uh, objects, uh, like statue or altar or temple or something like that. Uh, so uh, those, those are specific words um, on, on those occasions. Uh, the word proskuneo, though, you know, we see it in the Gospels. We, oh, we see it definitely in the book of Revelation. It's used a handful of times in the book of Acts. We see proskuneo twice in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 and then in Hebrews chapter 11. But then in Paul's epistles, only here. I don't know why I just jumped with 1 Corinthians. Uh, but, but one reason, I think, and it's important to bring uh, it to our attention this morning, is that in the Gospels, Jesus is with man. Jesus is with mankind. Men and women can put their eyes upon him. You know, so he's there in bodily form. He's there in physical form. So people can absolutely fall flat before him. People can fall prostrate, uh, prostrate uh, you know, before him. They can see him. And when we go into the book of Revelation, uh, where you see this word used so many times, there are, of course, 
uh, a lot of uh, heavenly visions that are given there. Jesus, um, you know, is in heaven, and we read of the uh, uh, we read of the twenty four elders. Uh, we read of the, the cherubim, the seraphim, the heavenly hosts. Uh, we read there in Revelation of the uh, of the blood washed multitude around the glassy sea, and they're all falling down, and they're all worshiping Jesus, but. We're in a period, we, as the church, um, you know, like those who receive the epistles in the New Testament where, you know, Jesus isn't with us uh, in bodily form, right? He isn't with us here where we can uh, see him, touch him. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we're supposed to worship him nevertheless as the church, right? We still have to worship him. So why is it hardly mentioned at all? Um, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 4, verse 20, uh, John chapter 4, verse 20, uh, you'll know there that Jesus is talking to the, uh, uh, to the Samaritan woman at the well at Sychar. Uh, and I mentioned uh, this briefly, very briefly, uh, uh, in, these, in these last weeks. But this woman had uh, been married five times. And at this point, she was now living with a man that wasn't her husband. And we kind of interject here, John 4.20, uh, where they're having this sort of theological discussion in the middle of all her personal needs and Jesus offering her water that would mean that she would never thirst again. And the woman says there uh, in verse 20 of John chapter 4, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And look what Jesus says to her in verses 21 through 24. Of John chapter 4 his response is woman believe me a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you Samaritans worship what you do not know we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews right yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Um, and this is very telling, uh, you know, Jesus' response. So I gave you that word, uh, proskuneo, uh, and the Hebrew equivalent to uh, the Greek word proskuneo is, and I'm not going to be able to get it from my throat there, is, but shafa. Uh, I can't say it right because I sound like I'm speaking Klingon when I do it. <laughs> but, I, you know, but, I, I, but, you know, it's that meaning, the same meaning. In, it's the equivalent to what we see here in the New Testament. In the Old Testament there, shafa, to bow down, to crouch, to fall flat, to stoop, uh, is the meaning there. So we have to understand that that main Hebrew word that has to do with worship um, and you'll see it throughout the Old Testament. I mean, that word is, uh, again, not word uh, not used every time speaking of bowing down before God, um, but on numerous occasions uh, it is. Uh, but we have to understand that it has to do uh, with worship concerning what you do physically, uh, prostrating yourself before God, falling flat, stooping, crouching, bowing down uh, before him. And again, just like I said, it's there in the Gospels, you know, when people come before Jesus and they bow before him. And again, it's there in Revelation where oh, everything, the whole heavenly host, the heavenly realm, people are bowing before Jesus in bodily form and worshiping him physically and then only used once uh, in the epistles of somebody bowing down because they're struck by conviction uh, you know, of hearing a word of prophecy to them is what we find there in 1 Corinthians. So I think what Jesus is saying here is, you know, there's a time coming. We read here in John chapter 4. There's a time coming, and, and, and now is when it's about, it's not about what, uh, you know, about what mountain you worship at. It's not about uh, what physical place uh, you're at. It's not about form. It's not about ritual but it has to do with the heart, is what he's saying. Uh, you know, so he, 
he's saying that worship won't be uh, localized, right? You know, but rather instead of localized, worship will be internalized. It's with the heart. So rather than being an external thing, worship is going to be right in the very depths of your heart, in the depths of your being. And so Jesus is saying here in John chapter 4 that true worship happens in what? In spirit and in truth. So it's without a place, right? Without, without this mountain or that mountain, without this temple or, or that temple or that shrine or, or whatever. And it's without outward forms, but rather that worship is carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's interacting with our human spirit. It's interacting with our hearts according to the truth of who God the Father is and who we are related to him. And we've been talking about that. So uh, in verses 21 through 24 of John chapter 4, Jesus is just breaking decisively from all the outward forms as a definition of what worship is. Worship has nothing to do with the place, right? You know, we might say we go to church, right? But more rightly so, we are the church. We're going to this building, and we are thankful for it. We're thankful and grateful for this place the Lord has given us where the church comes and gathers. The church is the people, and it really has nothing to do with the building except that we are blessed to have this place to come and to gather as the church, as the people of God. It's not about a place. not about a temple. It's not about a mountain. It's not about holy days. It's not about seasons or or feasts, or festivals, right? That we read so much of in the Old Testament and in the New, right? It's not about rituals, it's not about rites. The New Testament, the new covenant believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? You know, God dwells within you. God dwells within me, right? And it's, a, it's an incredible thing. You are the sanctuary of God. And it's beautiful. The Holy Spirit indwells you. All right, Every day, every day because of that, every single day is a holy day to a New Testament believer. It's not just the Sabbath. or It's not just some special uh, festival or season, but every single day, whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, uh, we are meant to do it all to the glory of God. And that is the worship of a New Testament believer. That's the worship of us, believers uh, in Christ Jesus. And uh, we certainly don't want to, like some I think have, we don't want to go back, and I think some have done it without realizing it, go back to a little bit of the, the Old Testament uh, uh, understanding uh, of what worship was. And it wasn't everyone uh, in the Old Testament, but, um, you know, but have we, in the sense of, uh, you know, we don't want to connect more with a procedure or a rite or a ritual or a behavior rather than, you know, what's going on uh, deep down in the depths of our hearts. It's all about the heart. Um, and is probably, uh, you know, with the backdrop of that, uh, you know, in, in the Old Testament that the apostles were really uh, laboring you know, to emphasize the internal nature of that spirit, truth, uh, worship, rather than what we do bodily, right? Not, not that what we do bodily is unimportant, right? Uh, it certainly uh, is important. Jesus spoke to this when he cited uh, uh, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses 7 through 9. Uh, Matthew 15, he said to the Pharisees, Matthew 15, beginning in verse 7, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules, right? So in other words, he doesn't want empty religion, right? He doesn't want empty worship. And we see... Uh, we see that a great deal, not only from the Pharisees. We see it in the Old Testament, his people. God's response to that Old Testament empty worship, it's just, it's staggering. Look at the word. We uh, are familiar with these words probably, but look at the first chapter of Isaiah, beginning in verse 10 and continuing through verse 16. 
Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Look at the words. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I, I cannot hear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. The words of the Lord, right? You know, the depravity had become so great. You know, everything, the religion, the worship, so empty, so meaningless. You know, it does not escape the Lord's attention. He said, he said very similar sense through the prophet Amos. If you're you can read through all of uh, Amos chapter 5 if you want to. I'm not going to. But Amos chapter 5, but let me give you just verses 23 and 24. Amos 5, uh, beginning in verse 23. Away with the noise of your songs, right? He doesn't want to hear. I, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream, right? Right? Uh and, and don't misunderstand uh, what I'm saying. I, I don't want to be critical of any, uh, of any praise or any uh, uh, method or, or medium uh, of praise. You know, uh, by all means, let there be loud, exuberant, celebratory, you know, praise. Right? You know, we, we've been in services uh, such as that. I'm sure we've been, you know, in gatherings and assemblies where, uh, you know, that is the case. It's beautiful. You know, uh, but I will, we can say that many, uh, even in that sense, there's a lot of um, songwriters and uh, praise leaders uh, who have recognized the problem of emptiness and meaningless in terms of, you know, what are the songs? What's the music if, if, if there's nothing in the heart, right? Um, I, I, I grabbed a quote from uh, Graham Kendrick. Uh, that, may, that name may not mean much. Uh, he wrote a very familiar praise song, you know, uh, Shine, Jesus Shine. You know that one? I can't sing it. I won't sing it. <laughs> I, was gonna, I thought about it for a moment, but then, <laughs> then I, thought, I thought better. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if that would come out uh, better or worse than my attempts at Hebrew, but uh, I, I thought about it. Anyway. Uh, he said, his, his words, and I think it's actually quite powerful. Uh, he said, worship has been misunderstood as something that arises from a feeling which comes upon you. But it's vital that we understand that it's rooted in a conscious act of will to serve and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I think that's very powerful, you know, because uh, that's right. We can get taken up with feelings. Not that feelings aren't important. Of course they are. They're God-given. Our feelings are certainly important. However, keep in mind that you can get feelings anywhere, right? You go to a concert. You know, you're, you, there's feelings that are stirred up within you. You go, you know, you go to the theater to watch a production, and there are feelings that are stirred up within you. You go to the movies, and there are, look, the last two movies I saw didn't even have real people in them. They were like animated, you know, Inside Out 2, you know, Elemental. And I still had feelings stirring up within me. You know, these things aren't even real, you know. And still, you know, you can get feelings from that. You can get feelings, you know, any, uh, at the ballpark. I mean, my goodness, my amazing Mets, they swept the Yankees twice this season. I was stirred within, you know. There was something within me, you know. All right. When any time Queens takes out the Bronx, right? You know, there's, there's something stirring within you. There's, there's feelings that are being 
are being aroused. You know, we can be taken up in feelings. You know, uh, even recently on vacation, you know, as the as the skies, you know, uh, were putting on a show every evening, the sunset, lightning storms, you know, whatever it was, you know, uh, the feelings are there. True worship is something different. It's different than that. You know, it, uh, it's it's more than being taken up. Uh, with feelings, it's it's exactly what I just said from that quote. It's an act of will, where we consciously serve and obey our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, uh, uh, you, you've heard songs uh, from uh, uh, Chris Tomlin, I'm sure. Uh, his words, his words. Uh, worship is where God isn't moved by the quality of our voice, and He has a beautiful voice isn't moved by the quality of our voice, but by the condition of our hearts. In that sense, maybe I should try singing. <laughs> if my heart's really in it. But the heart of the matter, uh, as we've said over and over, is that matter of the heart. It's the condition of the heart. You even saw the condition of the heart from James chapter 3, right? You know, it needs to be right. It has to be right. So what is true worship? What is it? You know, let's look at our text, Romans 12, 1. Uh, you know, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves, uh, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, excuse me, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your true and proper worship. Um, and it's interesting that Paul, so I gave you that word earlier, uh, proskuneo, and Paul does not use the word proskuneo for worship, right? Um, he uses a word that we see a handful of times uh, in the New Testament, uh, letraia. He uses the word letraia, and it's a Greek word for worship, but it's, that word is directly associated with both service and and sacrifice when directed toward God. Okay, this is this is Paul's understanding here, and so Paul says to uh, these uh, Christians in, in Rome, he's saying, "I urge you," and this is a strong word too. You know, he's saying to them, "I urge you, I, I, I exhort you, I beg of you, I plead with you, I appeal to you," and, and I'm just you look through the uh, you know the parallel Bibles. You look through all the translations. These are words that we see. I encourage you. You know, I, I beseech you. Whatever your translation might say. But that it's the feeling is there. And it indicates to us that it's exactly what we were just saying. That it's a matter of the will. That it's your choice to make. That's why he's urging them. That's why he's exhorting and encouraging them. Because it's their choice to make. And it's our choice to make too. You know, you absolutely engage your will when you worship God. You do it when you come here. You do it when you're worshiping in private. But you are engaging your will. You choose to do it. I choose to do it. Um, and, and that's a, a very strong point. And, but even for, look at the words there in Romans 12.1. That choice is only possible. Only possible when it's in response to the mercies of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy is what Paul says. It, that, that's what it's all about. You know, the only way that we truly worship is in response to who God is and to what he's done and to what he has said in his word. It's in response to his person. So it's not just willpower, right? But it's when we as... A, as individual believers, and we as the church, we just, and what else can we do but just melt, you know, before his grace and before his greatness? I mean, when his grace and his greatness just like grabs hold of you, and you just, I mean, what else can we do? You know, this verse tells us that we sacrifice, and this is the word that Paul's using, uh, Lathraya, you know, that we sacrifice as what? As a, as a choice, as a free will response to God's great grace and his goodness in our lives. Um, you'll have religion with its rights and its rules and its 
rituals and, and everything. And it, religion sacrifices for mercy to gain it. But we, what Paul's saying is we sacrifice from mercy in appreciation. Right? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, what? In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your true and your proper worship. But Paul's saying, look, look at what God has done for you. That's what he's saying to us this morning. It's a great reminder. Look at what God's done for you. Okay, we have been going through the book of Romans. Look at what God's done for you. I mean, I, 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 think about the messages that we've been receiving throughout this book. Think about the verses and the passages that we've been reading in Romans. You talk about mercies. I mean, oh my word, it, it's incredible. It, you know, it, you, you read through the book of Romans again. Maybe you've forgotten. All right, read through it, and you are bombarded by the wonderful mercies of God. Let's think about it. Think about some of the things that we have read about. I'll be quick with it, but just consider some of the things we talked about. The book of Romans talks about how we are justified by faith, and we have peace with God. That's just a start, right? Uh, we're justified by his blood. The book of Romans talks about how we are adopted, yes, right? When we become heirs of God, we become joint heirs with Jesus, we're adopted into God's family, we are children of God. And now we have that spirit of adoption rising up uh, within us, and we know that it's no longer a spirit of fear, but the spirit of God's Son just rising up, and what does the book of Romans say? It's crying out, Abba, Father, that we can come to him and call him Daddy. With reverence, but with just this beautiful sense of relationship. We're in the family. We're in Christ. We are, as Romans says, identified with Jesus Christ. We're identified with his, his death, with his burial, with his resurrection. It's awesome. We are no longer, what have we talked about? We're no longer under the law, right? We talked at length about that. Weeks, right? We're no longer under the law, but we are under grace and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. How awesome is that? You know, we've received the gift of the indwelling spirit of God and God lives within us now. Uh, we have read, you know, we, we've read in the book of Romans that we have help in times of affliction. His spirit interprets all those moanings and groanings within the deepest part of our soul where we can't even pray to God with words that can be uttered. We can't find them, right? You know, we read about that great election and the purposes of God in our lives as a church. We read about the certainty of, uh, of the coming glory that, would, you know, whatever we're going through right now, uh, whatever suffering of this world is not worthy to be compared with what will be uh, revealed to us in a day that's yet to come. And the book of Romans talks about the, the confidence that we have that we will never, ever, ever, as children of God, be separated from God, that nothing in heaven, earth, hell, or any place can, you know, can separate us from his love, not even death. Mercies of God, Right? That's just from the book of Romans as we've been going through it. Come on. Paul's saying that because of all these mercies and so many more, because of all these blessings, he's saying, you know, everything that we've been seeing through the book of Romans, because of all of these, I urge you, I implore you, I plead with you, sacrifice yourself, lay down your life, give your bodies. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your true and your proper worship. Because of this, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And, um, and uh, then, you know, we see within uh, the text there, you know, uh, uh, that spiritual act, you know, we can see it translated as your, um, your, your reasonable. In fact, uh, when you look at the Amplified, uh, your reasonable, your, your rational, your logical, your intelligent, act of worship. That's, that's what it means, that spiritual act of worship. Uh, 
your translation might say reasonable service, right? That, that reasonable, that, that rational, that intelligent and logical service. Uh, do you know what it was in the Old Testament? Uh, back in the Old Testament, you know, that reasonable service, according to the word of God, was to bring a sacrifice to God, right? You know, uh, you know whatever that sacrifice was, whatever you, could, whatever you could afford, you brought it to God. But in the New Testament, because the mercies of God are far greater, the reasonable service is also far greater. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You know, it's, it's not bringing a sacrifice. What does Paul tell us? It's being a sacrifice. And what a difference that makes. This is, this is priestly service, is what it is, right? We are priests of God. The Bible says you are a royal priesthood, right? A holy nation. And as priests, you and I are being asked to bring a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is you. You know, and, you know, God's just asking you because of his great love to bring yourself and to lay yourself on the altar. You know, it's not it's not just your it's not just your body. You know, I, I think, you know, what's inferred is that, the, you know, the body here contains and it does say body by all means i'm not changing the words you know we, we offer your bodies is what paul says there in romans 12 1 but i think and paul has spoken of this often and again uh, in his epistles but you know that idea of the soul and the spirit it's your whole being body soul spirit god wants you to bring your entire being he, in other words he doesn't just want your work you know he, he wants you we do, we do work for him, absolutely, out of our love for him, and, and to uh, continue to bring uh, the gospel and the power of that message uh, to the world. But, you know, listen, he just wants you. In other words, you and I, we can do all sorts of things for God and never, ever give him ourselves. And that's, that's not true worship. True and proper worship is giving him yourself uh, is what it is. Uh, Warren, Warren Wiersbe, uh, his words, he said, Worship is the believer's response of all that they are, mind, emotions, will, body, to what God is and says and does. That's a, it, it, it's it, wonderful words. Um, and he's right. Um, someone has said, not uh, but uh, worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of the conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of the will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless, emotion of which our nation uh, uh, nature is capable therefore it is the chief remedy for that self-centeredness which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin um, I think those were the words I didn't write it down but I think those were the words of William uh, Temple um, but uh, but absolutely correct self-centeredness is uh, you know absolutely it's just abolished it's just destroyed when we get caught up with the greatness of our god he wants all of you he wants all of me you know um, maybe the two greatest uh, gifts that uh, that god can give us are just a true sense of uh, ourselves what we really are and then uh, a true sense of who he is you know who he really is and if you get a revelation of who god is then have to give yourself entirely to him how could it be otherwise right if we truly see him truly know him um, in the old testament there were certain offerings that would be uh, given by the people uh, and the priests uh, you know they could eat some of the meat uh, of those offerings but but the burnt offering uh, was a little different uh, just quickly the burnt offering 
had to be entirely given to God. Not part of it, all of it. So there were other sacrifices, there were other offerings where a portion could be taken out, but not the burnt offering. The burnt offering had to be entirely given to God. And I think, maybe, in a sense, that's what's being spoken of here. You just have to, and Paul said it, you have to die to yourself. That's worship. That's true and proper worship. Dying to yourself and giving yourself completely as an entire, as a whole sacrifice to the Lord. And uh, that's the imagery. I think we, it's a striking image, actually. A living sacrifice. I mean, it's just, uh, what, what's a living sacrifice? It's alive. I mean, it, the sacrifice stays alive on the altar. That's what it is. And because it's alive, you, you know, in other words, you and I have been bought and brought alive. We've been brought out of death and into life in Christ. Hopefully our old selves have died, right? You know, that's the key. And we're now alive in Jesus. But if you are alive in Christ, you are going to continually need to be giving yourself over and over again to the Lord, putting yourself on the altar. It's a daily thing. Just giving ourselves daily over to him, wholly, entirely over to him. Why? Because we're living sacrifices. And someone has said the problem with a living sacrifice is that it crawls off the altar. And, right? Absolutely. I mean, so, so, so where, where are you? Where are we? You know, our, our, the question would be, as, as we, I'm going to close, are you on God's altar that living sacrifice, or are you off God's altar? Are, you know, is there just a is there just a small part of you that's on the altar, right? You know, and maybe you were once on the altar, but but no longer. You know, it's uh, we need to continually place ourselves there. Um, let me put it in a it's probably an easier way to put it. Uh, where is your heart? Where's my heart? I'm not just asking you. These are you know. It's all of us, you know. If this worship, this true and proper worship, it, you know, that, that, that Paul's speaking of here, you know, if it's all about the heart, and it is, um, that sacrifice and service from the heart, then where is your heart? What did Jesus say uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Where, where's my treasure? You know, where's my heart? I'm not exempt. You know, it's all of us. You know, what is our worship worth? It's got to be worth something. What, what's our singing worth, right? What's our praise worth? We talked about worthiness being a part of this in the beginning. You know, if we're not laying down our lives, if we're not giving the things that are most worthy in our lives, that are of most value to us, you know, then what is our worship? Uh, Billy Graham, uh, he put it like this. His words, uh, Billy Graham said, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. He said, the greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and the helpless. Yeah. Um, another, another quote from C.T. Studd. Um, Studd said, if, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then what sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him? And if I'm not mistaken, I, I could be wrong, but I thought C.T. Studd was rather... I mean, he was very well educated, and I think he was heir to a fortune. And he still said that. What is worship? That's, that was where we started this morning. It's, it's giving your all. Paul saying, I beseech you, therefore, I, I implore you, I beg of you, because of the mercies of God, that you present your body, soul, spirit, everything, as a living sacrifice, constantly rededicating yourself to the altar of God. We have to constantly, continually put ourselves there daily because this is your true and proper worship. This is what God deserves and this is what God requires. You know, 
And so what does he see today? You know, when he looks on us here, what does he see in our hearts? Uh, and something for us to consider as we, as we close today. But I hope that we'll consider it uh, daily. You know, what's he, what's he seeing within us? You know, where's the treasure? Where's our heart? I think it'll bring us closer to him. I know it'll bring us closer to him when we see him and we understand his mercies and see him for who he is and his nature, you know, that never changes. Uh, and he'll just continually change things for us and transform us. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week. Maybe just verse two next week. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right, let's, let's pray. Lord, uh, I don't know what a verse, Lord. I, I got I. <clears throat> I got caught up, Lord. I found myself uh, as I was studying, going down so many roads, <laughs> and finding myself, Lord, just. Uh, uh, but it's a good thing. I, I just I, you know, we. Getting lost in your word in a good way, um, just following those those trails that lead us to to more understanding and uh, I just, you know, just what a joy it is to really dive into Paul's words here, even in a single verse and, and to just see where it leads to those, uh, you know, some, some portions of text in the Old Testament and, and, and the words in, in the Hebrew and, and in the Greek and uh, all of this, Lord, just, I, I, it's amazing uh, to help bring to us an understanding of what this of what this worship is uh, you know what, what you truly see as true and proper worship what you truly see is a genuine uh, expression of worship um, it can't be empty you know I, uh, my brother was talking last week <laughs> you know the same thing you know you know, you, you, won't, you won't accept, you know, that emptiness or putting on a show. It has to be real. It has to be genuine. Um, and, it, you know, it really comes from a heart that's for you, the heart that's continually seeking to give all to you. Um, you know, I, I pray that our, our hearts, you know, will, uh, will just long There'll just be a passion within our hearts to, to be uh, nearer to you, all of us, the, our whole being, body, soul, spirit, uh, all connecting, all having that experience of you. Um, I, I pray that through the study of this and, and through uh, you know, the guidance of your spirit that we'd have a better, better understanding of worship. Uh, in our lives as, as believers, in our lives as the church, just gathering together uh, as an assembly um, to do this, to worship, to worship you, um, you know, that you would truly be pleased uh, because you know that it comes from hearts that are, that are for you. Um, whatever we do, however we sing and however we, we offer our praise and thanksgiving, whether we're, we're quiet or loud or you know, moving or still, whatever the case may be, Lord, that it's, that it's truly from a heart that's, that's for you. May we continually glorify your name above all things and, and magnify your name and preach your gospel uh, to this world so that lives and hearts can be transformed. Um, in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.